Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dan, the voice behind that Kaito Dan, and welcome to my review for Ruby Volume 4 Chapter 9. Two steps forward, two steps back. Before we begin, let me remind you that this video will have spoilers to not just the episode in question, but also past episodes as well, so watch at your own risk. So Rooster Teeth were super kind this weekend, and released a new episode out on my birthday. Okay, but seriously, after we capped off 2016 with a major info nuke from Crow, and some bonding time with the Belladonnas, we kicked off 2017 with things starting to rise into the volume's final moments. But was this a nice birthday treat for me in the end? Or was it a rough start for a brand new year? Let's find out. We open back in Patch, with Yang and Tai Yang trading blows, working in on the Firecracker's new limb, with good old Swai watching on. Not only does this uh, see how Yang's getting on with the arm, but we can also see that Tai's not too shabby himself when it comes to combat. Makes sense, as it was noted in the past, that Tai is still an active huntsman, so it's no real shock that he can still hold his own. Yang's looking like a natural after a few weeks since she first put the prosthetic on, but Tai does quip about Yang being off balance. Not so much physically, as she's pretty solid there, but in a different sense. Once Yang gets rocked onto her backside, Tai expands on his comments, seeing Yang as unbalanced when it comes to her mindset in a fight. He knows his daughter is tough and spirited, but Yang is also lacking when it comes to strategy or controlling her emotions, letting her semblance be her most common game plan and a lot of her actions being fueled by her anger, as proven with the amount of time she showcased both in the tournament. Yes, it's a neat skill to have, being able to take damage or use her anger to retaliate even stronger, but what if it doesn't work? What if like the fight with Neo, Yang can't land the blows and she gets too frustrated to think? Or what if her foe is so strong that it doesn't matter how much she can take or dish out? If Yang's anger rises so much with each failed attempt that it gets out of control, her offense has no rhyme or reason to it. It's just aimless swings with no plan while her foe can continue to adapt with a clear mind, knowing that they can handle Yang's trump card. This is a lesson that Yang desperately needs, to help break her off from her stubbornness, a trait that Tai feels Yang shares with her mother, Raven. Yep, it seems Tai's finally okay talking about Raven now, accepting Yang's ready for such a topic, and we even hear elements that he actually liked in the mysterious woman. Her strength, her ambition, and her dedication to any goal or cause. It's those traits that Tai loved in Raven, and loves to see was passed on to Yang. But he's not shy in admitting that he is glad that Yang isn't completely like her mother. She is quite the complicated woman, so much so that a lot of her flaws ended up being a key factor in Team Stark and the family being hurt pretty badly. I imagine some of that comes from her doggy dog mindset and her tribe upbringing, and what eventually would lead to her leaving in the end. But it definitely looks like Raven really did a number on those close to her. I seriously hope one day we do see some kind of flashback for Team Stark in their younger days, or during the early times of the family, before things went south, as that definitely sounds like a fascinating and emotionally charged time. Anyway, Yang does have her mother stubbornness, and in Tai's eyes, he believes both have the issue of trying to force through an issue, rather than trying to look at all the options to find a different solution. A charming little demonstration walking around Zwei as his example. Strength isn't everything, and Yang will have to take on board that sometimes the best option isn't just to go charging in guns blazing. That maybe it's best to think first, then punch. The two blondes then up for one last bar for the day, and we get some cool camera direction and choreography in the process. Good job from the team making this scrap feel quick, strong, and sharp. And much to Tai's joy and ours, Yang seems to have picked up on Tai's advice, as seen when she gets one over on her old man. She's getting her fire back, guys. She's not the only one in training, though, as we check in on Weiss's continued attempts to summon the knight while she's barred from leaving Atlas. She's getting really close, but in comes the little snot Whitley. The new Schnee heir came by to rub in his freedom and new position, but he does get questioned about why he's doing all this in the first place, why he's thinking he's jealous of his sisters for their huntress abilities, though Whitley denies it. 
I don't know. Part of me reckons he is jealous, just denying it to not give Weiss any satisfaction of being correct. But this could seem to mean that Whitley doesn't have his semblance unlocked, either because he's lacking compared to his sisters, or he simply chooses not to, which seems to be the most likely option, since he says the Huntsman lifestyle is beneath people like him and his father. Perhaps to keep his son committed to the kind of air role that he would like to have, Jacques made sure that Whitley wouldn't become a Huntsman, doing so by denying his son access to his semblance, and convincing him to see Huntsman as worthless, compared to an army. Though Whitley also notes his disdain for Ironwood as its general. Either way, the pest seems to have had his fun for now trying to brag everything going good for him and bad for Weiss, parting with seeing whatever she's up to as just plain pointless. Weiss's response? Door meets face. She's not taking in anything her little brother is saying right now. She wants her mind clear and her emotions in check for her summoning, especially since it seems to take quite a lot of focus and energy to pull off, even resulting in some major surrounding damage. Klein bursts in to check if Weiss is okay with all the noise going on and... Well, yeah. I think she's doing just great, Klein. Weiss has done it. She's finally summoned the knight and it is freaking awesome. I love the steam and smoke emitting off the armor, and while it's notably smaller than the original, I wouldn't be shocked if Weiss will eventually be able to change its size. For now though, she needs a favor from Klein, and I don't think it's to help fix the window. Looks like Weiss is finally ready to say goodbye to Atlas, at least for the time being. I hope she at least rubs her success in her father's face though with one last big night showcase FU as her goodbye for now. So things are looking up for two members of Team Ruby, but with the resident Faunus member of the group, she's got a lot to deal with right now, as we catch up on her and Sun's chase for the spy that they caught on to last episode. Accompanied by a pretty epic sounding background piece, the chase leads to some rooftops, and the spy reveals a nifty trick up her sleeve switching her skin color from a stealthy pitch black to her more natural color. Turns out this lass is a chameleon faunus, even right down to her hairstyle looking like a chameleon's tail. On top of that, she's packing a cool looking dust barreled spike whip. Blake and Sun have the girl sandwiched and they try to grab her scroll, likely thinking that she used it to keep in contact with her allies in the White Fang during her task. The spy puts up a decent fight, even busting her mask just to get Sun off her, but the monkey boy's many clones manage to dogpile on her, so Blake can grab the gadget. Though only for a bit, as Sun's semblance wears off from overuse, four clones likely being his maximum that he can use without being drained, especially with the added effort to keep the spy down. It's here the mask finally breaks off, and Blake reveals the spy's identity to be as we expected. The girl mentioned by the Albane twins previously, Ilya Amitola. A very fitting name given Amitola in Native American means rainbow, like the many colors she could change her skin to as per her chameleon trait. She's voiced by Jeremy Lee, who you guys may know as the woman behind Asuna Yuki from the Sword Art Online series, Lucy Hartphilia from the Fairy Tales series, and the current voice for Minako Aino, aka Sailor Venus from the Sailor Moon series. Sadly, this reunion isn't friendly, as Ilya lashes out with her electrified whip right into Sun's chest near his heart, severely damaging him. The now angry red and yellow toned Ilya demands Blake hand over the scroll, but even with Sun hurt, she refuses. In the end, Ilya yields, turning a seemingly saddened green and blue shade before retreating in a puff of smoke, letting Blake check in on Sun crushed to see another friend hurt by someone from Blake's former group. Sun's not dead, thankfully, but he's not looking good and he needs help stat. We won't know his fate until next time though, as we then head over to Ruby with the rest of Team Ranger, and a very rough looking crow, talking deliriously in his sleep and mentioning Ty and someone else. By the sounds of it, this other person, either Summer or Raven, isn't coming back from whatever they're involved in, or something similar to that nature. Perhaps saying Summer's not coming back from her final mission, or Raven's not returning home. Again, I'm really hoping we see some old Stark moments soon. But for now, the gang needs to get Crow some additional help ASAP. Thankfully, Ren spots a sign leading towards Mistral and Kushinashi, 
a village mentioned in the Mistral World of Remnant, as well as a new location that's being crossed out, Kuro Yuri. And given his and Nora's reaction when seeing the sign, it looks like this new place has some history with the two, or at least just Ren. The big problem though, is the road leading to Mistral leads through some mountains, and there's no way they can take Crow through there. Ruby chimes in that they should try Kuro Yuri, but Ren outright refuses the idea, acting far more negative than usual. Think it's safe to say that Kuro Yuri may be Ren's old home, wishing to not go there to avoid the hurt of seeing what's left of it. Nora backs up a partner and comes with a compromise, splitting up. The team sloth pair can go through the mountains and see if they can get some help along the way, or from Mistral, while Ruby and Jean can take Crow through Kuro Yuri. It's a risky move that Jean is quick to want to shut down, but Crow is getting worse and worse, and time is of the essence. So in the end, the swordsman begrudgingly accepts, hugging Ren and wishing for the pair to keep safe, to watch each other's backs like they always have. I can't be the only one seeing some death lags, right? I'm incredibly worried now for Ren and Nora's safety, but this was a very touching and heartbreaking scene, especially with Ren and Nora, who have been on top form this volume. It's here why I'm going to go into the meanings behind the names of Kushinashi and Kuro Yuri, as per the trend of Mistral villages having hidden meanings behind their name. First up is Ren and Nora's destination, Kushinashi which is Japanese for the gardenia flower, and in the language of flowers, means secret love. And suddenly, the Renora shippers are losing their goddamn minds. Could we finally see the two admit to wanting to be together together? As for Ren's supposed home of Kuro Yuri, it's a bit harder to scope. Referring to the Kankachka lily, in the language of flowers, this name means love or curse. Now that's definitely interesting. We can imagine the curse part might play into Crow's bad luck semblance, but what about the village being cursed to its unfortunate fate? And what about the love part? What love can be found in a destroyed village? What I'm thinking is perhaps love and maybe curse as well might play into Crow's hallucinations, since they seem to be involved in Ty and one, if not both, of his former loves, Raven and Summer. Kuro Yuri may have a lot of things good or bad within it, but it could be where we finally hear something interesting in regards to the lives of Team Stark. But for now, Team Ranger is split off. Ruby tries to keep Jean's spirits up for their friends, but the Knight knows this is a very dangerous situation, and she silently agrees. Things are looking rough on the horizon, especially as the episode ends when we see the two walking over a familiar mark in the ground. The same one from Shion that seems to be tied to the Grim that took down that village and on a Yuri, as well as the beast possibly tied to Raven's group, who could come in once more to aid or confront her sickly brother and finally meet the sister of her distant daughter. Talk about a fitting title for the first episode in the volume to have all four members of Team Ruby in it. We had the pair of Yang and Weiss gaining some progress that should help them push on in their lives, while Blake and Ruby came out of this entry with plenty to fear and fret over. Two steps forward, two steps back indeed. Not only that, but it was all very entertaining and refreshing to watch every key character arc in the group for one episode. Yang probably had the most simple scene against the others, but it was one that was packed to the brim with some more outstanding emotion from Tai and Yang, and a key landmark for Yang's maturity as both a person and a huntress, looking into her weaknesses in combat and seeing her handle the robot arm fine after some wearing in time, whilst also scoping into what makes her the passionate spitfire that we all know and love. Obviously, I doubt she's fully recovered yet, as I imagine her PTSD is still affecting her, and we won't know her true emotional state until we finally see her in action, and when she finally clashes again with Adam. But it is rewarding overall for her in this episode. On top of that, we got better insight on the relationship that Ty had with his estranged first love Raven, and how similar Yang is to the mysterious woman. Brought out by some of the best acting in the volume from Bernie and Barbara, who definitely felt extremely natural as father and daughter. We even had a pretty cool tussle to go along with the fun. While Yang's arc this volume has been probably the least explored, it's hardly been a weak chain of events, 
and I thoroughly look forward to more from the blondes back in patch. Weiss had a pretty basic scene too, since most of it was just her finally achieving the night summoning, but it can't be ignored that that is a huge accomplishment for her, even with Whitley's involvement trying to wound her emotionally. It allowed us to see that she can take the body blows now that would have upset her before, especially when it came from her family, and turn it instead into fuel to better herself, to prove her doubters wrong, and to continue her goals to better the Schnee name. Now she has the knight, I imagine she'll now have Klein form a distraction so she can make her getaway. But of course the question is, where will she go? Perhaps get some support from Ironwood? Or maybe go back to Vale or even check out Patch to see if Ruby and Yang are there, which of course they aren't. Or maybe she could even find her way to Mantle, the former capital of Atlas. Blake's development with another old face from her White Fang days definitely sets up what looks to be another dramatic time for her to end the volume on, but I do like the difference in her attitude with Ilya compared to how she acted with Adam, looking far more composed than before, but still with a defiance to her former ally's actions. Given the chameleon gal seemed almost sad to see Blake again, I wonder if these two were friends during the Fang days. Blake's departure perhaps hurting Ilya, and now seeing her as an enemy is making things even more painful for the spy. Ilya, by the way, has probably one of my favourite new designs overall for a character introduced in this volume. I love the sleek ninja-like approach to her attire, as well as how the chameleon elements aren't just limited to her skin change ability, but also her hairstyle and the badass extending tongue-like whip that she uses. It's overall a very well-crafted character based on design alone, and I cannot wait to see more of her and her relationship with Blake. I don't see Sun dying, mind you, from her attack. At the very least, it may put him out on the shelf for the rest of the volume, and that would lead to Blake being an ally down once Adam finally makes his reappearance. But it was good either way to see Sun being a helpful aid to Blake. The guy's been getting a pretty bad rep this volume, and I think it's a little harsh personally. So seeing him cope well this time out was a welcome sight. And the final scene was another pivotal moment for its characters involved, as well as a nervy cliffhanger to end on. Ren and Nora have been so satisfying to watch this volume, and once again, we saw Ren with a far more outspoken and emotional tone than before, while Nora was as supportive and loving as we know she can be, acting as a medium between understanding Ren's current emotions and accepting the urgency of the situation they're in. They do make a great pair, and it's why I really do hope they make it through this volume okay, as I want to see more of the two in new situations. In the end, this episode was fantastic, in how well it carried not just the hopeful signs of progress and growth, but also a sense of danger, sadness, and fear, especially for the first episode to feature all four pressing character arcs of the volume, helped by some more wonderful acting, some more beautiful background designs, and more perfect use of fitting musical pieces. For the voice acting praise of the episode though, I can't help but want to praise Bernie Burns as Tai Yang, who as I said before, felt so natural as an insightful father, whilst also feeling very honest in his reflective discussion on Raven, and how proud he was of Yang. This performance proved why I feel few could have played this charming, yet warm character more effectively than Bernie. So, all in all, 2017 looks to have started strong for Ruby in my opinion. A golden episode full of ups and downs that has set up another climactic final portion of a volume on a high mark. Several effective stepping stones for improvements in character arcs, and enough tension to make the weight for the next episode feel even heavier. Yeah, I can't deny feeling positive that things will continue to please me for the rest of the year for the show. But that's just my feelings, be sure to share yours in the comments down below. And at the same time, if you wish to, hit the like and fave buttons, as well as click on the subscribe and bell buttons to make sure you get every new upload as they come out. Be sure to follow me on Twitter too, at ThatKaitoDan, for all updates on future videos, and anything on Ruby, not to mention just anything else I have on my mind. Until next time though, have a good day or good night, and peace out.